Our last speaker, Dr. Dan Peterson, has chosen a challenging topic, uh, precision medicine and artificial intelligence in the diagnosis and treatment of MECFS. Yes, it's a pleasure to be here and to uh, give a very superficial overview of this and then some examples of how it might apply for the clinicians. I'm reminded uh, coming back here of 30 years ago when I brought a patient here uh, for diagnosis and potential treatment and I saw Dr. Steven Strauss and he also saw the patient and left me with the wisdom that science will prevail. And uh, I, I think that's come true as we've seen in the last two days, but it's just a shame it took 30 years. How do I go? Which one do I do here, Tom? So I'm just going to give a very superficial overview of uh, artificial intelligence, precision medicine, and then do some case studies that illustrate the utility. So I want to add to the basics about MECFS one uh, big negative at the bottom of this list of impressive statistics, that there's a total lack of trained physicians to take care of these patients, and there's additionally lack of access. So where do you start if you're going to apply artificial intelligence to a disease like this? Well, it helps if you have some plausible mechanisms that you can look at in your big data accumulation. And there was a recent article by the recently deceased Jonas Bloomberg from Sweden that is a nice review of potential mechanisms, and all of you can refer to that. He presents many, many possible hypothetical mechanisms that could be explored using uh, artificial intelligence. And if we accept that many of the patients have an infectious trigger, that's another uh, way of looking at this in managing big data. So the potential of AI and MECFS, <clears throat> well, AI has already been used in diagnosis of liver disease, inflammatory bowel disease, and is now being applied to new definitions of rheumatological disease. Imaging analysis has come up, and I just might do a side uh, comment that there's a new software for 3D uh, MRIs that are going to replace physical exams. It's like a driverless car. You go in for your whole body MRI 3D and you get a uh, diagnosis of splenomegaly or lymphoma or something else based on big data. Disease modeling has been successful in Parkinson's disease and breast cancer. And there are firms out there now that will take your big data and disease model for you, particularly in chronic diseases. It's also useful for subtyping, which I think we've all talked about, drug repurposing, but you need a large, large uh, N of patients in order to do this. There are examples in other diseases uh, that of disease modeling using a completely AI in order to get there. There are three papers I found about using uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence in chronic fatigue to separate depression from chronic fatigue, uh, neural networks, the kind of thing that Nancy showed, and in uh, other aspects. What about precision medicine and MECFS? Well, this is sort of mandated by the economics these times about uh, more precise, and actually there's an NIH initiative for precision medicine, and it's showed great success in treatment of certain cancers, particularly breast cancer. Well, what about CFS? It would be useful, of course, for uh, taking this great array of data that we're all collecting to subset patients. Perhaps we could use it for drug repurposing. And, uh, to pause on drug repurposing, spironolactone is an old, old drug used as a diuretic for congestive heart failure and other, and now recently has been reported to prevent EBV replication. We all know that if a new drug were designed today for chronic fatigue syndrome, it would take five to 10 years to get marketed and probably uh, three or four hundred million dollars. So I think repurposing is probably a better alternative. Here's an algorithm from the UCSF uh, fatigue clinic where I was for five years that ends up in the far right with chronic fatigue syndrome. 
and we're in the process of operationalizing this so it's easier for a primary care doctor to do the differential diagnosis for fatigue, which is, I think, the second most common complaint that people come into a primary care office with. So deep phenotyping is a part of uh, precision medicine. You really have to know the patient and what's going on in order to, uh, to prescribe precision medicine. Well, we can use it for uh, dissecting subsets and identifying treatment. Longitudinal data is very, very useful, and we accumulated a great deal of this at the seven sites in the CDC six-year longitudinal study, including many, many questionnaires, uh, self-assessments, and some biological specimens. Unfortunately, as you all know, one of the problems we have publishing is that we don't have evidence-based literature. But we're finally at the lowest level here, thanks to Lucinda and other collaborators, because we are designing consensus opinions with respect to effective treatments and diagnoses. So we gotta move up this ladder eventually, but it's a slow process and it takes large numbers. So one of the approaches that I've been using at Sierra Eternal Medicine is to amass all this data and enter it into a database. We're entering it into REDCap, the um, infectious agents, the immune findings, the functional studies, including ETT, MRIs, et cetera, so that we can make better decisions about these patients. Here's an algorithm for how I decide who gets IVGG, antiviral therapy, amino acids, saline, or even amplogen under some circumstances. And I always measure something before, during, and after therapy. So I wanted to share, lastly, some case studies so you understand really how this can practically be applied. First case, standard kind of 23-year-old classic onset. He was uh, forced to do cognitive behavioral therapy and graded exercise, which made him worse. He came to see me as mannose binding globulin deficiency, recurrent infections, was treated with intravenous gamma globulin, and returned to the university. Second case, a patient who had lots of pain, cognitive dysfunction, elevated inflammatory cytokines, absence of IL-10. I treated him with Enbrel, and three months later, he had normalization of his cytokines and marked improvement in his cognitive dysfunction. Here's a patient who had intestinal uh, dysbiosis and amino acid deficiencies. Cerebral spinal fluid uh, demonstrated these abnormalities as well and was treated with IV amino acids with an improvement in his cognitive dysfunction but it's hard to continue that therapy. This was a case that was allegedly post-Lyme disease with severe headaches and cognitive problems as well as fatigue. The spinal fluid was positive for Powassan, but not for any of the Lyme-related agents. Powassan is associated with vector-borne disease. Another case of uh, IgM positive, PCR positive Parvo, with concomitant herpes viruses, as Jose mentioned, who was treated with IVGG and antiviral therapy with a significant improvement in symptoms. Here's a case that came from a laboratory exposure, severe headaches and encephalopathic kind of picture with HHV7 PCR from the uh, peripheral blood as well as the spinal fluid. She was referred to infectious disease for antiviral therapy. Another tool I use, and there are many, many variations on this, is GenomeMind, and this I find helpful because it will tell you the, uh, the profile of the patient and which drugs may work, which ones will have side effects, and which ones you should not use in the realms of pain, sleep, uh, neurostimulants, and uh, just show you an example of how this works. If there is a red check on the far right, you should think twice or three times before utilizing that particular antidepressant or analgesic, and uh, it outlines for you the, um, the, the sp uh, side effects, and they also have experts who can discuss the genetics uh, with you. Pathogens is another interest. I've become very fond of the overnight PCR results that you can get out if you send it out early enough, and I just wanted to show you four examples. The first one was a urinary tract infection in a male patient 
turned out to be Pseudomonas. I would have never guessed that. Treated successfully with symptomatic relief. The second case on the right was interesting. A woman who'd had a cough for several weeks turns out to have whooping cough. There's a resurgence of whooping cough on the West Coast, and I would have never really thought of that probably. The uh, third case is a woman who'd been sick for quite some time, and a lot of times on the upper respiratory uh, PCRs, you get adenovirus and rhinovirus, and then you don't need to use an antibiotic. And uh, so this woman had Haemophilus, which was treated. And lastly, a GI PCR that in a woman who had several months of diarrhea, which was positive for Listeria. And on taking a better history, I found out that she was in the habit of eating unwashed vegetables. Okay. So, well, that's it. So I think there's a tremendous potential in CFS for artificial intelligence as well as precision medicine, and I look forward to instituting it.